GCC Chem 130 students. This is our last video, our fifth video for chapter three. We are now going to talk a little bit about temperature. So temperature measures atoms energy. So when you stick a thermometer in a liquid, for example, the liquids around the tip of the thermometer are hitting it and it measures the energy of those atoms and that is the temperature. So hot mo molecules move fast or slow? Hot. Yeah, they move fast. And they have lower high energy. If they're moving fast, they have high energy. Good job. So cold molecules move slow and have low energy. Yeah. So temperature is measured with a thermometer. We all know that. Nothing new there. There are three different temperature scales. The one we use in the United States for our weather and bodies is Fahrenheit, degrees F. In the rest of the world, they use Celsius, degrees C. And scientists use something called Kelvin, which is just a K, not degrees K. I'll explain that in a minute. Let's compare these three different temperature scales by looking at water's boiling and freezing points. So in Fahrenheit, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You probably didn't know that, but when you heat water up on your stove, it will bubble and begin to boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you probably know this, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees. Below that, it'll snow. Yeah, in Phoenix, we don't see that very often at all, do we? No, but in Flagstaff, you can. Now let's compare that to degrees Celsius. Celsius, they said, let's make this easy. So the boiling point of water is 100, and the freezing point of water is zero. That's pretty easy. Now, Kelvin may look a little strange. The boiling point of water is 373, and the freezing point of water is 273. Now, let's think about this. In Fahrenheit, can we have a negative temperature, like minus 5 degrees? Sure, just go to North Dakota. It's minus something degrees all the time up there. It's cold. Can we go below zero in degrees Celsius? Well, yeah, if zero is where water freezes, we can have ice colder than that, so we can cool it down, so we can definitely go to like minus 10 degrees Celsius. So Fahrenheit and Celsius can go negative. What about Kelvin? You probably don't know, so I'm going to let you know the point of this, you probably suspect, is that we can't go below zero in Kelvin. In fact, zero Kelvin is theoretically the lowest temperature possible. We've never actually gotten there, but we've gotten close. We think at zero Kelvin, even the atoms will stop moving and vibrating in place. You know how solid atoms move in place. We think even at zero Celsius, they would not, but we can't prove that. That's what we think. That's our hypothesis. So, Kelvin does not go below zero. It's zero is absolute zero, the coldest temperature possible. So zero Kelvin is the lowest possible temperature where molecules even stop moving, called absolute zero. So there's no such thing as negative Kelvins. This is just for fun. For Fahrenheit, zero degrees is really cold outside and 100 degrees is really hot outside. For Celsius, zero degrees is fairly cold outside and 100 degrees Celsius, you're dead. In Kelvin, zero degrees Kelvin, you're dead. 100 degrees Kelvin, you're dead. That's just being silly. All right, so temperatures. We need to be able to communicate with the rest of the world on how hot the weather's gonna be, so we need to communicate temperature and have conversions. And scientists need to convert from Celsius and Fahrenheit to Kelvin. So here's the equations we use for temperature conversions. Guess what? You don't have to memorize these. We give them to you on that shapes table. It's the very top line across here. Now remember we talked about this before. Somewhere on Canvas or the website, there's a periodic table you have to print it out and there's this shapes table with given information on top that you have to print out. 
because you're going to use them on exams. And if you click to a browser to look at them, that will be cheating on an exam if you're in an online or hybrid course. So you can't change away from the exam when you're taking it. The, we will know you did that and it's considered cheating. So you must print out the periodic table and the shapes table. And the equations are right up here, the same ones that are right here on the slide. So you don't have to memorize them. All right, let's practice. Phoenix can get up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh boy, it sure can. What is this to Celsius and Kelvin? So all we need to do is plug in 115 for degrees F and calculate Celsius. And then once we have Celsius, we can calculate Kelvin. So using these equations. So when we have degrees Fahrenheit, we're gonna use the first equation. We're gonna use the degree Celsius equals Fahrenheit minus 32 in parentheses, which means you need to hit equals before dividing by 1.8. We also have an equation, degrees Fahrenheit equals Celsius times 1.8. You can hit equals and then add 32. So those go back and forth between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Now, because we're given Fahrenheit, we wanna use the first one. So we've got 115 minus 32, hit equals 83. Now divide by 1.8 equals 46.11111111. So we're subtracting Fahrenheit minus 32. Subtracting means pay attention to decimal places. How many decimal places do we have? Well, none. 115 and 32 don't have decimal places. So our answer is not going to have any decimal places either. So it's just going to be 46 degrees Celsius. Great. Now, the third equation is Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273. Well, we just said Celsius is 46. So 46 plus 273 equals 319 Kelvin. So those are our answers, 46 degrees Celsius and 319 Kelvin. All right, so again, you have the equations on the back of the periodic table or the shapes table. So you don't have to memorize them. All you have to do is plug in and solve. So that's pretty easy. All right, let's move on and talk about heat. Heat and temperature are not the same thing. Heat measures the total energy of all the atoms in a sample, not just the ones hitting the tip of the thermometer. So it depends on how many atoms there are because it measures the energy of all the atoms. So let's look at these beakers here. A is fairly full and it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. B is less than half full and it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Number one, which of these two beakers has the higher temperature? Why? This may be a trick question. They're both at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, aren't they? So one's not higher than the other. They're both at degrees at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Number two, which has the greater amount of heat, A or B? Remember, heat measures the energy of all the atoms. Which beaker has more atoms or molecules in it? A. So if A has more atoms, it must have more heat. Yes, because there's a larger volume. So A has more heat than B because there's more atoms in it. All right, the temperature is the same in both beakers, but A has more water, more molecules moving around, so there's more energy, so there's more heat. Good job. Heat transfer. Heat transfers from high temperatures to low temperatures. In other words, heat transfers from hot to cold. Let's consider holding a cookie straight from the oven. What is losing heat? The cookie, right? The cookie's hot and it's losing heat. What is gaining heat? 
your hand, it feels hot because you're holding a hot cookie. So your hand is gaining heat. Yeah. So we can say the cookie is transferring heat to the hand. We can say heat is transferring from the cookie to the hand. Let's try another one. A piece of metal is placed in a freezer for a long time. The metal is then put in a bucket of hot water. Okay, so a metal coming out of the freezer is put in a bucket of hot water. Does the temperature of the metal increase, decrease, or stay the same? Okay, so the metal came out of the freezer, so it's cold. We put it in a bucket of hot water, so the metal's temperature will increase. Why? It's gaining heat from that hot water. Yeah, the temperature in the metal increases as it gains heat from that hot water. Does the temperature of the water in the bucket increase, decrease, or stay the same? Yeah, the water's hot, but it's transferring some heat to the metal. So the temperature will go down. So the temperature of the water is decreasing because it's losing heat to the metal. So the temperature of the water decreases as it loses heat. So we can say heat transfers from the hot water to the cold metal. Heat transfers from hot to cold. All right, does that make sense for heat transfer? From hot to cold. All right, cool, good job. All right, exam one is coming pretty soon. You need to study the chapters, one, two, three, whatever chapters are on your first exam. Read your chapters and do the end of chapter problems. They're either in Canvas or on a website for you. You need to do the worksheets that I mentioned earlier, especially the one for chapter three. You need to practice conversions and density. Practice, practice, practice conversions and density. So work on those practice worksheets that again are either in Canvas or on the website, depending on who your instructor is. There's YouTube videos, obviously this, you're watching. There's some other videos for chapter three showing me working some extra problems out. Watch those too. So again, this is your lecture and those extra videos or practice problems over conversions and density that you should watch. Watch all the videos for all the chapters on exam one. So again, you, need, you really need to practice conversion density and temperature problems for exam one. You need to know your sig fig rules. Don't forget if you have any Canvas homework or homework due, make sure you turn that in. All right, we got a few more practice problems if time. Martin's head is 19 inches around. How many millimeters is this? Number two, Dr. Kim's famous vodka punch has a density of 1.15 grams per milliliter. How many milliliters is 24.5 grams? If Heather drank 445 milliliters of the punch, how many cups is this? Is she gonna get sick? So I'm not gonna work these out for you. This is your turn. You need to pause, answer these three questions on paper, and then check your answers. Okay, hit pause now, practice these problems. This is good studying for exams and quizzes. Practice these three problems now. Okay, I hope you wrote these out and practiced them. I'm just gonna give you the answers down here. I'm not gonna show you how I got them. So if you have questions on these three questions, you can go to the tutoring or ask your instructor. Okay, so again, you have three problems to solve. There's the three answers. If you didn't get the answer, that's is exactly what you take to tutoring. You say, here's the question, here's the answer. I didn't get this. What am I doing wrong? So go to tutoring, go to your instructor, maybe it's me, and uh, make sure you know how to do these three problems. These are exactly what you're gonna see on exams and quizzes. All right, that is the end of chapter three, GCC Chem 130 students. Check you later.